My name's Kevin Mian. I'm, uh, I'm at Long Island University in Brooklyn. Um, of the uh, co-authors of a number of people who I work with. Um, so, uh, just a little bit about me. So, I uh, work in Long Island University. I'm uh, doing a number of studies related to borderline personality disorder. Um, I've been working for a number of years with uh, John Clarkin, um, who's uh, at Weill Cornell Medical Center, um, working with the group who's been looking at a treatment for borderline personality disorder, uh, transference-focused psychotherapy, which you all probably have some familiarity with. Um, and uh, so, you know, with that group, we've been looking at kind of different predictors of change in psychotherapy. And then at the university, uh, we're also then trying to do a number of studies looking at features of borderline pathology, and uh, primarily in the undergraduate students. Um, and uh, trying to understand kind of factors that then may help us kind of feed back to the treatment studies and kind of have a bit of a um, kind of convergence between the two. Uh, and so the study I'm going to talk a bit about today is on uh, facial recognition. Um, so um, specifically emotion recognition. So this will be, uh, the beginning part is no surprise to anyone that uh, kind of talking a bit about this idea of a kind of cyclical pattern of uh, emotional intensity uh, often triggered by interpersonal events, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, you know, kind of we're familiar with the vicious cycle that often occurs, right? Uh, you know, kind of a uh, interpersonal trigger will lead to the person to being quite upset, and then being quite upset will further complicate further interpersonal relationships, right? And um, so, you know, we know that this is the pattern. Um, what we wanted to try and really understand was what exactly is going awry in these interpersonal contexts. You know, what you know, where exactly is the process breaking down? Um, and so, one of the things we're very interested in is the processing of emotion cues. You know, uh, how are emotion cues in the other person who's being at, interacted with understood? And um, there have been a number of studies using these kind of. Uh, faces from, uh, you may be familiar with the work of Paul Ekman, the, you know, kind of the classic Ekman faces of the kind of basic they emotions. Oh, great, yeah. And, um, you, know, uh, you know, an important part of our social interacting is being able to recognize the emotions we see and then respond accordingly. Um, and, you know, you would expect that um, this would actually be a relatively straightforward area of research, right? That, um, you know, this these kinds of uh, faces have been presented to patients with borderline personality disorder, um, and the question has been asked, are people with borderline personality disorder, do they have trouble seeing emotions that other people might see? Sounds like a straightforward question, right? The thing that's incredibly complicated is the answer to that has been wildly different across studies. So there have been some studies that seem to indicate that people with borderline personality disorder are worse at this, right? Their kind of accuracy for emotion is lower than comparison groups. Uh, some studies say that they're better at this, that actually they have uh, enhanced recognition and are seeing emotions that others are not seeing. Right? And then another kind of set of studies are saying, no, 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 actually the way it works is that they are attributing emotions where emotions are not there. So instead of a, you know, highly emotional face, if I present a neutral face, there's an attribution that there's an emotion there. So this has actually led to a lot of confusion. How do we understand this? The findings are kind of all over the place. Um, you know, are those in BPD missing emotion cues? Are they over attributing emotion cues? Are they seeing cues that others wouldn't notice? And this Question. is... Question. Mm. Are they seeing the cues? Do they ever take account whether the faces you're looking at are faces that have no contextual reference to them, or are they looking at faces like parents, partners, would that make a difference? That would make a difference, yeah, so I mean, we don't have that, unfortunately we have these kind of, uh, but you know, the nice thing about these though is it gets at the stranger question, right? Um, you know, so, but you're right, we would expect differences with parents, yeah. partners, absolutely, absolutely. So mm -hmm. we wanted to unpack uh, this a little bit. And so, um, so we looked at this kind of dilemma and said to ourselves, why is it that these studies are coming up with such wildly different findings? And so we kind of focused on a few things that we tried to incorporate into our study. 
One is we really wanted to think about the level of intensity of the emotions being presented. Um, you know, that emotion I showed you a moment ago, you know, this kind of classic, uh, you know, Ekman face, you know, it's a very kind of full-on intense emotion. Um, but there's this idea that maybe people with borderline personality disorder are, you know, actually catching emotions that other people might not, right? This kind of idea of enhanced sensitivity, right? So um, this is a really important idea. Um, some people refer to this as the empathy paradox of borderline personality disorder, right? So that, you know, we're going along and talking and I'm telling you about my work and you kind of have a fleeting grimace or, you know, and I, I say, oh, I'm boring. This is awful, they didn't like it, right? You know, so kind of catch that kind of quick emotion and then kind of move in on it. Well, that's a hypothesis that's out there. If that's the case, then you can see what I said. I said a fleeting emotion, a kind of very quick, subtle emotion. A lot of these studies have used these very kind of intense faces to try and look at this question. And so one of the things we've been wondering about is, are those full, intense emotions, in some ways, the kind of wrong stimuli for the question? So what we tried to do in our study was use, um, really focus on very subtle expressions of emotions because mm. we thought that that's the place where all the action is. Um, another thing that we got curious about um, was whether a lot of, well, maybe one of the reasons that there's been a lot of these contradictory findings uh, in the past has been because it's kind of, uh, mixing up two different processes that actually happen when we decide uh, what emotion we're seeing. So think about it. We look at somebody and when we see an emotion on their face, we actually go through a two-stage process. One is we just very quickly say, is that an emotion at all, right? We kind of just very quickly kind of notice whether an emotion is there. Um, very quick kind of reflexive sort of process. And then probably a little bit later, comes in the labeling of what emotion is that, right? And those are actually two different things. And one of the things that we really were wondering is, um, do people with borderline personality disorder actually struggle maybe with one but not the other? Or is there, more specifically, we had the hunch that maybe the problems that are going on with misreading of emotion cues is in the first, in the kind of just quickly like, you know, kind of is assessing for an emotion um, rather than kind of choosing the wrong one, which is a slightly different problem. Um, so uh, what we wanted, and most studies that look at this don't separate that out. They present you an emotion and then they give you the choices of which one it is. Um, and so that's, you know, really kind of labeling of an emotion. That's that second stage. We wanted to get back to the first of just even seeing whether an emotion is there or not. Um, get at that kind of very quick initial impression. So uh, what we did was we actually separated our task into two different stages to let us look at each independently. The third reason we thought that there might be all these kind of contradictory findings in the past studies is we were wondering whether there was a kind of missing variable, that kind of there was another uh, character, another feature that maybe should be pulled into the mix that might help explain why some people are acting different than others. And the one we focused on was something uh, called effortful control. Um, this is, uh, comes from the tradition of thinking about temperament and specifically thinking about impulse control. Um, you know, this is around an idea that's related to planfulness. Um, can I hold off on doing something that I really want right now in the service of a goal later on, right? So. Uh, you know, my gut feeling is chocolate cookies, I would love to dive in and eat that entire plate, right? But uh, in the service of a goal of, you know, not, you know, being uh, heavy and gaining weight, I'm going to hold off and maybe keep it to one, maybe later, right? You know, so, uh, and so the ability for that kind of constraint is uh, called effortful control. One of the things we wondered about was if it is the case that there is some sort of, you know, bias in uh, recognizing emotions, it's probably a very much a knee-jerk thing, right? A knee-jerk, ooh, I want that cookie. A knee-jerk, ooh, you're mad at me. And does the capacity for effortful control, kind of the ability to put the brakes on these automatic processes, actually help people uh, to maybe not just run with these first impressions? 
Um, so we also kind of included uh, measuring efferable control as another piece we thought that may help understand why some people might uh, have a harder or easier time recognizing these emotions. So that's, uh, these are the kind of questions we were asking as we went into uh, looking at uh, looking at this. Um, now, as I mentioned, um, uh, we uh, tend to do our studies at the university in undergraduates. So these are not uh, patients with borderline personality disorder. These are students who fall on a range of borderline personality features. Um, so we give them questionnaires asking about their symptoms. Um, and what I'll say about that is that there are some downsides to working with undergraduates instead of patients, right? They're not, they're not patients. Um, but at the same time, there is an idea in research that sometimes it's really important to both uh, evaluate a process in the full disorder extreme as well as in the naturally occurring traits in all of us, right? And that the idea is that if the model is a good one, it should hold in both, right? Um, and in fact, sometimes when you just evaluate things in the full disorder, it's, it's tricky because if you think about it, you know, a lot of patients with borderline personality disorder also have comorbid depression, also have anxiety, or also have substance abuse. And so it's hard, it gets hard to, you know, so yes, then that group is different, but is it because of the borderline features, or borderline personality disorder in particular, or is it a number of, and so sometimes it gets hard to disentangle these things, and so it becomes important to evaluate these things both in the people with the full disorder and in uh, kind of a continuum of features, and if it works in both, then we think we really got something. So this is emphasizing the more um, non, non-clinical and looking at a kind of range of borderline features to see how it relates to uh, this emotion recognition. So we got a group of 132 undergraduates. Um, they uh, are young um, and uh, because it's in downtown Brooklyn, multicultural as uh, uh, young undergrads in Brooklyn would be. Um, overwhelmingly female, um, which is also uh, the case these days in undergrad institutions. Um, oh yeah, it's, my, my, my undergrad psych classes are, I would say, three quarters women every semester. Um, we, um, before doing this, give them a test for face blindness. You know, they're just some people who uh, are unable to see faces and kind of, you know, it's a, it's a rare thing. We uh, didn't really, we only had to exclude one person for questionable face recognition. Um, and then we uh, give them the skid 2 screener for personality disorders to get the um, what borderline symptoms they're endorsing. And then we also give them a questionnaire that gets at this effortful control that I was describing. Um, and then after that, we give them <coughs> our uh, facial uh, emotion recognition task. Um, so as I mentioned before, um, we break up our task into two different phases. Um, and uh, we want to, like as I was describing, we want to first, in this first half, get at the kind of very quick automatic impressions of whether a person thinks an emotion is there or not. Okay. Um, I'll talk about, then we ask them to label the emotions, I'll talk about that in a moment. <coughs> but, so rather, unlike the tasks that usually do this where they say, well is this neutral or is it sad or is it anger or is it fear and it gives you all these choices, we just simply ask them, neutral or emotion, is that an emotion or is that not an emotion? This is just detection. Um, now, even though they're only deciding is it neutral or is it an emotion, um, we have faces that have a range of emotions, negative emotions, sadness, fear, anger, and disgust. Uh, we have neutral faces mixed in there. And also, as I was mentioning before, you know, we really uh, had the feeling that uh, subtle emotions was uh, particularly of interest. And so we had the pictures uh, kind of uh, morphed along a range from 100% uh, neutral to 25% uh, of the neutral face combined with, uh, um, no, 25% of the emotion combined with 75% of the neutral face, 50% of the emotion up to 75%. So we don't use the 100%. Um, <laughs> do that. They're, 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 these are stock pictures, oh. um, and then uh, we have a, we have a, much more tech savvy than me, first of there's software that does these kinds of mergings. They've uh, done a lot of really great things with these, you know, like um, another great study, they actually did um, 
hybrid emotions. They will um, they'll use the software to uh, merge a sad face, uh, same actor with a sad face and an angry face, um, and then look at you know how, for example, borderline features relates to kind of which one you think it is when it's actually both. Um, uh, but anyway, so this uh, you know, so you can see though that you know the down to the twenty five percent. This is very subtle, right? So if I were to just give you this face and say, is that an emotion? That's a tough one, right? I mean, that is you know that's that's a, a difficult task. Um, let me see if this actually will show you the task. Okay, it's going to work. Did it fail? No, it's okay. It did. This is just what it looks like. The other thing is it's quick. So you have to pick motion, neutral, right? You just quick pick. Um, and we purposely make it happen very quickly. If you don't pick within two seconds, it moves on to the next one. Again, because we don't want people to sit there and deliberate. We want people's kind of gut impression of is it an emotion, is it an emotion, is it an emotion, is it an emotion. And we do, you know, many, many, many trials of this, and this get, helps us get at, you know, these kind of knee-jerk reactions. Okay. Um, okay. And then after that, we give them the labeling task. So this is take your time, look at it. Which of the five emotions do you think that this is? Four emotions plus neutral. Um, and so this is more like the way this has traditionally been evaluated in other studies. The one thing we did different on this is, in this labeling task, we only use those 25% emotion faces. Mm -hmm. so, so you get to take your time and label it, but only the very subtle emotions. Okay, so again, this is very difficult, right? Um, you know, uh, did you give this to all the healthy people? And so we give this to all the students with a range, along a range of Whoa, features. It's, hard. Yeah, it's very hard. Um, they do not love doing this, but it moves quick, so at least it's kind of uh, keeps it going. Let me see if this one will work. So, so then this one, uh, they have it's self-paced. Um, the slide's moving on, but it's self-paced when you it moves on when you choose. But again, you can see that these are very subtle emotions here. Okay, so what do we find? Okay, so first I'm going to talk about with the detection, right? So this is the kind of very quick automatic. Is it, a, is it an emotion or, or not? And so what we found was that, um, actually, so we separated out when the correct answer was neutral and when the correct answer was emotion. Because there's been some literature showing that those actually have very different patterns, and we found that as well. So what we found was that as the students went up in borderline symptoms, um, when the, the, they, the higher the borderline features, the worse they were at detecting neutral faces, and the better they were at detecting emotion faces. Okay? That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, now, even though they were just choosing between neutral or emotion, you remember I told you that when the correct answer was emotion, it could be among a number of different kinds of emotion. Yeah. And I also told you it could be, you know, subtle to 50% up to. Uh, 75%. So uh, in the next few slides, I'm going to just break it down by those categories, even though the answer was only, correct answer was emotion. Okay, so this breaks it out by the type of emotion. And, well, first of all, this is just interesting. So what you can see is that in the green here, this is disgust. The sample overall was just much better at detecting disgust than a lot of other emotions. Yeah, um, which actually is interesting. Um, the evolutionary psychologists find a similar sort of thing that actually the expression of disgust is a very um, data rich look on our faces. We actually have a lot of kind of facial points that kind of cue disgust relative to something like sadness, which actually doesn't have quite as many, you know, kind of. So, so everybody overall was much better at picking out disgust than the other emotions. But you can see that the higher you go on borderline features, as you go up, the better you are at detecting disgust. Uh, higher the borderline features go, the better you are at detecting anger in the red, and as higher in borderline features, the better you are at detecting fear in the yellow. Uh, that's that same purple line from before. Uh, sad did not quite make it. Uh, it was close, it was a trend, but it wasn't quite significant. Um, so then we also broke it out by how subtle the emotions were. 
Um, so, not surprisingly, uh, the, the more strong the emotion was presented up here, the better everybody was at it. Um, as it got down to that 25%, which we were talking about, was really hard. You can see that people were only getting it correct in the kind of, I think the average was around 45% of the time, right? So, um, but, um, you know, they're kind of hovering around chance, practically. Um, but you can see that those, for the higher your borderline features, the better you are at picking out the subtle emotions. And then actually when we go up to 50%, that line is not nearly as strong. And by the time we get to 75%, it's almost, it's statistically not significant. It's statistically flat. So uh, borderline features doesn't do you much in terms of whether you do better or worse with the more obvious emotions. But the higher your borderline features, the better you are at detecting those subtle emotions. Um, hmm. We um, These people know that. Yes. <laughs> right. um, okay, so then, as I mentioned before, um, we um, had this measure of effortful control. Um, and so you'll remember that I was saying that we wanted to see of people who are kind of better versus worse at control, does that moderate the relationship? And so I'm going to break these out separately. So this is first with that finding of neutral, right? So you remember I said that uh, as borderline features go up, uh, the worse they do at neutral detection. Well, that is uh, particularly true of those who also have low effortful control. So high borderline, poor control, you're much worse at seeing neutral faces. Uh, you can Say see, that again? Sure. High, high borderline, uh, low control, uh, you uh, do worse at seeing neutral face. In other words, put it this you way. You can't pick them out. In other words, you are, you make the error of saying that's an emotion when it isn't there. Higher borderline, worse control, you're wrong in saying that's an emotion when it wasn't. Um, if we look at it now, same idea on the emotion side, right? So um, we said before that the higher you are on borderline features, the more accurate you are at detecting emotions? Well, again, that is true for those with low effortful control. In other words, high borderline features, poor control, you say that's an emotion and that is actually right. So you get the right emotion? You get, well, so uh, this one it's just asking is it any emotion? Um, so they correctly called that an emotion was there. Mm -hmm. I'll, it's a little hard. I'll, I'll explain what no, we got I'll, it. you got it, but yeah, I'll, I'll kind of go through it again. But they haven't labeled the emotion. It's they don't have to label it. They don't have to label they're it. They're just sensing it. They're just sensing it. That's right. That's right. Uh, this is, we did some statistics where we put it all together uh, in terms of the um, borderline, effortful control, and the different level of intensities. And basically the punchline is you can see that the, the red here um, same idea, high borderline, low effortful control, better at detecting subtle emotions. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay, and then we did the labeling task. Now the labeling task uh, is a little more straightforward, right? Because it's just, are they picking the correct emotion or not? Um, but again, remember that the labeling is that self-paced, it's slower, but it's 25%. They're all only subtle emotions or neutral. Um, so, as you can see, it's really hard. People did not, people actually were pretty good overall at noticing when it was a neutral emotion. They could pick neutral pretty well. When there was a subtle emotion there, they were picking one of the emotions, but were pretty bad at picking which one, right? So it's like, I, I, it's like people were pretty good at saying, I have a sense that that's an emotion there subtly, but I can't tell you which one. As a group, they tended to do bad. But higher on borderline features, the better you are at picking correctly which emotion it was when it was anger and when it was fear. And disgust. Uh, and disgust misses by a hair. Um, but it, it, there's a trend there. Sadness, not at all. Um, but disgust is getting close. In a bigger sample, I think we'd have something there. And then again, the same idea that um, in the neutral, uh, higher borderline features, the worse you are at 
catching that that neutral is. In other words, they called it an emotion, right? So higher borderline features more likely you are to call neutral an emotion when it wasn't. Huh? Okay, so just to summarize, um, so, you know, so we really wanted to get at this kind of very quick reflexive process, not you know, which emotion, but is there, is there an emotion there at that kind of very uh, kind of knee-jerk level? And uh, what we found was that um, when uh, the higher borderline features you have, um, the more likely you see a neutral face and you say, that's an emotion, and that's wrong. And higher borderline features and there's an emotion face, the more likely you're to say, that's an emotion, and that's correct. Right? Um, and we found that that was particularly the case when the emotions were very subtle. The differences started to really fall out when we got the more full expressions of emotions. And the better emotion, better equitable control you had, the better kind of breaks you have, the less you show those biases. Right? So if the bias is, you know, you show me a neutral face and I say that's an emotion. Wrong. Uh, show, me, show me a face, sorry, neutral face, and that's an emotion, that's wrong. An emotion face, I say that's an emotion, that's correct. Like, so the bias is like, yep, there it is, yep, there it is, yep, there it is. But if you have better effortful control, you're less likely to have, kind of swing in that bias direction. Uh, and then again, when we looked at the labeling, which is that kind of slower, a little more reflection, we again find that higher borderline features, more likely to uh, correctly identify that anger, more likely to correctly identify that fear, and also uh, uh, less likely to be correct with neutral, which means basically calling neutral an emotion as well. Um, so, what does this tell us? So, the way we kind of uh, are phrasing it, which again is going to mean no surprise mm -hmm. to this uh, group, but um, the way we talk about it is as an emotional sensitivity in borderline personality. Um, and, um, and we, the way we say it is a bias towards attributing negative emotion that is either not or barely present, right? Um, and, you know, we kind of think it's important to phrase it that way because I think that it gets us away from the way it kind of previously has gotten framed, which is, are people with borderline personality disorder, you know, correct in the emotions that they uh, attribute or incorrect? And we actually think that that's kind of a problem to frame it that way, right? And that that's maybe a bit of why there's been some confusion. It's not that they're either more correct or less correct. It's that there's a bias, right? Um, if the emotion is barely there, it's a bias that catches it. And if an emotion is not there, it's a bias that says it's there even when it's not, right? So sometimes it's right and sometimes it's wrong. It's kind of being oversensitive on a side that sometimes catches the correct answer and sometimes leads you astray, right? And so we kind of think that that's the way to really focus on it. And a lot of the times when it gets talked about, about kind of inaccurate or accurate, it's not, it's kind of not quite the way to, to frame it. Is it attribution? Well, that's what we, and so this is the thing that we think we're thinking a lot about is that it's interesting that you find this really for anger and fear and disgust popped up in the first uh, um, detection phase, um, but not sadness. And so one of the things that we, this is a kind of bit of a follow-up, but we don't, but we think about is that, you know, these biases are showing themselves around emotions that evoke rejection, right? Um, you know, that these are the, emo you know, if someone, you know, ha looks angry at me, right, or kind of a look of fear or a look of disgust, you know, then, then this, you know, gets the, gets the system going, right, and so in that context you're going to see this bias. Sadness, it's a negative emotion, but it's not necessarily about... It's not threatening. It's not threatening, that's correct, right, and so, um, and so it's, so I think that it's exactly that, that we're seeing this kind of around uh, projection sensitive emotion. Um, but I think so the point we kind of want to make though is that, um, you know, is, is the person with borderline personality disorder potentially catching emotions that other people may not see or may notice and let go? Perhaps yes, right? But is also the person with borderline personality disorder um, saying an emotion's there that wasn't there? Also 
perhaps yes, right? And so these are not mutually exclusive, and they sometimes almost get talked about as such. Um, and, uh, you know, people, the kind of better effortful control one has, um, the kind of better kind of reins one has on their kind of knee-jerk responses, uh, the less of this we're seeing. So it's a really a buffer against that kind of um, oversensitivity. Um, in terms of the research, you know, so, the, you know, this is just one study, I and mean, there's lots of studies that could come out of this kind of thing. Um, we focus on negative emotions. Um, uh, we could look at whether uh, similar processes are in positive emotions. There's been less focus on positive emotions. Um, the few studies that have looked at, you know, happiness, joy, haven't really found a lot of differences along um, borderline personality disorder. But, you know, one of the things that they talk about in the effortful control literature, in the literature on regulation of impulses, is that um, it's not just negative emotions that we have to try and regulate. The positive emotions are something to regulate too, you know? Um, so, you know, like, uh, you know, let's say, you know, um, I say, oh, I'm not going to have that cookie, but then in the course of this talk, I'm getting stressed, I get, you know, stage fright, and then I, so then I'm, you know, my, you know, uh, my stress is up, my controls are down, and I have the cookie I planned on not having, right? Um, so, you know, this happens a lot where kind of in the face of distress, our controls start to loosen. Well, but in the face of positive emotion, our controls actually loosen too, right? I mean, this is, think about you know, what happens at parties, right? Where people, you know, kind of make not so great decisions at what's ostensibly a happy event, right? Um, you know, that uh, positive emotion is also an emotion that needs regulation and so can kind of uh, potentially, and so we, so this would be an interesting thing to look at whether this um, buffer that I described is around in, um, positive emotions as well as negative. Um, we're very interested in the idea of, well, these happen to be the rejection-ish emotions, but that's a hunch, right? I mean, so we are interested in, are there ways to maybe more directly get at the rejection piece? Um, you know, um, people are doing interesting things uh, with these faces. Um, uh, you know, Eric Furtuck has done some interesting stuff on giving these kind of faces, but instead of saying, what emotion is this? Uh, in his work, he asks, how trustworthy does this face look, right? very interesting question, right? Because trustworthy is not, you know, it's a very kind of subjective, you know, and so, you know, you could do things like how rejection, rejecting like this face look or things like that to get more directly at this uh, idea that we're putting out there. Um, and, you know, as I was saying earlier, we really would want to replicate this in patients with borderline personality disorder to really s know that the model holds at kind of the full continuum of the pathology. Um, but I think that, you know, there's a lot of implications that can kind of come out of this in terms of, you know, working with uh, people with borderline personality disorder, both for, in terms of clinicians and also family members, right? Um, and one of the things that um, we kind of think is important is this idea I was saying before of kind of trying to step away from the idea of whether the person was accurate or inaccurate or right or wrong, right? Um, because in some ways it's just... It's, it's a losing debate, as you know, right? And, you know, you really don't know, right? I mean, you know, I, you know the, there are times uh, where in a given moment, you know, someone says, oh, you, you know, you're annoyed, right? Patient says, or a family member says, you're annoyed with me. You know, I, I'm not aware of being annoyed with you. My face could have been blank, right? And an emotion was attributed that genuinely wasn't there. or Maybe there was something there. Maybe I did grimace for a minute, but it was related to indigestion, not the conversation. Or like, I mean, you know, that these, you know, and that it's in some ways a losing discussion to try and, I think, say, like, no, I did. you're wrong. No, I'm right. No, you're wrong. You know, and to kind of get away from that not. Um, and I think one of the things that this has also kind of made us appreciate is that, you know, what's, what's interesting about this kind of task is, you know, the face is flicked for a second, right? And then the next face, and the next face. There's something about that that almost kind of mimics, but uh, real life, but is almost kind of uh, way less than actually happens in a given interaction, right? I mean, think about it here. As we're, you know, here talking and I'm saying these things, right? And Valerie's face is right, expressive and moving and right, smiling and curious. Right? I'm like, there is so much information in our faces that happens, right? Just kind of continually unloading, and. 
you know, some of it very subtle, you know, and maybe, you know, in the course of this, I'm just going to, we can't possibly attend to every fleeting emotion that goes across a person's face, right? And so usually a lot of times, what do we do? We actually rely on a schema rather than on every little piece of information, right? So I know Valerie, I know that we have a good relationship. And so even if it, there is a kind of cock brow going hmm, for a moment, I'm going to breeze right over that because I know, you know, and we have a good rapport. And so I'm not going to worry about every fleeting little emotion, right? Um, there, Bless your poor right? <laughs> well, no, but see, that's the, that's the idea, right? That you're, you know, that information is there, but I can kind of very quickly breeze past it because I don't find it particularly relevant, right? In, this, in the context of our relationship, right? Um, and so it really becomes, uh, in the case of borderline personality disorder, where if it's the opposite, if in some ways I have a kind of, you know, and going into the interaction with a basic mistrust, and I'm looking for signs of rejection, um, well, uh, it's bound to be there at some point, right? Again, the fa our faces kind of scroll through so many emotions that there probably are subtle moments that the person is correctly attending to. And then there's probably other moments that are just blank that the person is over attributing to. Right? And so you can't, as the receiver of this, know really at any moment what you necessarily put out there. But I think something like, at least clinically, I try and do as a therapist is, you know, so someone, let's say, a borderline patient says to me, like, um, you know, like, oh, you, you just gave me a nasty look. You think what I'm saying is garbage, right? I, I, I don't say, no, I didn't, right? I'll say, like, oh, you know, like, you know, tell, tell me what you saw, right? And, you know, kind of with a bit of, uh, it may have been there, it may not have been, I, you know, can't be sure. And then... Another thing that then often comes up in the discussion is, you know, there's, you know, you're worried about whether I am disinterested in you. There's so much information here that you could take. It could be that, you know, grimace brow that went by, maybe that was there. But there's also that, here I am, I was waiting for you the second you came, I've been hanging on every word, this discussion, right? And those could all be taken as signs that I'm actually very interested in you, right? But of all the kind of, so there's lots of data here. Maybe some that I'm not interested, maybe some that I am. Why, why is it that the ones that I'm not interested in have taken up so much power, right? I've taken up so much, you know, that, you know. You so would ask that. I would ask that, I would ask that. So it's not that like that did happen or that didn't happen, but of all the things that are going on between us, why is that the thing that has kind of led to the level of certainty, right? Because um, then you're kind of getting away from the, the right or wrong and more towards this question of, um, you know, of wh what's, what's going on with this selective attention. You know how we would handle that mm. in, in what we teach in class? Mm. So the first thing you would do, you would validate, wow, it must be very upsetting yep. to think that right. I'm not paying attention mm -hmm. to you. Mm -hmm. At the same time, um, I was about to sneeze, or at the same time yep. I had an itch, yep. or at the same yep. time um, I saw a cockroach, or at the same time right. you have to explain your thought process in detail yep. so that you bring down threats. So right. you say, but I'm really interested in, I'm sorry that if you felt that way. Yeah. See, that, that's great, because I think that the, the impulse is to contradict. No, I didn't, right? You know, and it sounds like you, I mean, you do a lot of trying to get the, out of that it's it's For a downward. Us it's reduced threat. Absolutely. It's to Absolutely. acknowledge it and reduce the threat. Right. Right. Yeah. Which is you gotta be as on, you gotta mm -hmm. be watching. It's exhausting. Yeah. Yes? I think it's it's, exhausting. I think but I think that's so yes. consistent with, you know, kind of what we've been thinking about kind of coming out of this. I think that's really right on. So. It's but what, what we see it as is this <coughs> highly tuned sense of threat mm -hmm. and the more you're closer to them the more you trigger them yeah but you I don't know do you mind if I yeah no no I'm done that's it so that I'll do I have a sit, thank sit, you sit. but uh, yeah yeah so what, we'll talk what, about what's it. very interesting is I've never seen anybody put effortful control in with yeah. it yeah. and what that makes me think of is we didn't introduce ourselves so we go around the room and you know who you're talking to but with family members, and I think it's very important for um, clinicians to know this, 
when you deal with a borderline in therapy and you talk to a family member, you're talking about two different people. Mm -hmm. Because the borderline in real life going around the world seems so apparently competent. Yes. So it's almost as if, if somebody, com correct me if you understand what I'm trying to say, the effortful control can be used with strangers, mm -hmm. but it goes out the window with mm -hmm. people close to you. Does that make sense? Yeah. They can't control mm -hmm. it. It's, well, I, I don't know why. They, because I've never seen eff effortful c control put into this equation. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think about it? I think it's very important uh, part of it. Mm -hmm. yeah, it made a lot of sense what you said. If it has a uh, low effort, I mean, control uh, and, and high, you know, mm -hmm. it makes them skew yeah. their, you know, the emotions. By the way, everything you described is in the singular. I told you yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything. <laughs> it's all in the singular. I, I just have one other question, sure. too. Um, when you did the uh, labeling, mm -hmm. you gave labels yes. to them. Yes, yes. What I find with my daughter is I don't think she's labeling correctly. Mm. It would be interesting to do that study where you didn't give labels and see what word they gave. Oh, that's them. interesting. Because oh, she will come up. Yeah, 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 and yeah. And she, she has a very, she's mm. very intelligent, but when it comes to labeling, emotions yeah but she might say I'm bored and she really means she's sad <coughs> you know and, and she'll say in general bored for right, right, a lot right. of press or um, <sighs> this and if she really isn't if you probe yeah it's not the label is right. not matching the emotion that she's feeling I like that just you could give the face and just a blank yeah, and they it'd fill, be interesting fill in. to yeah, see yeah. What that's your Alexithardia studies, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because they can't let, they don't know what they feel. Yeah. That's why we but have the shirt. they also don't have the vocabulary for what they feel emotionally. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you know what Alexithardia like the, the is? The distinction between, you know, uh, sad and another word. You, you know, know what Alexithardia is? No. Alexithardia A is without Lex's word, and there's studies showing that borderlines have Alexithardia, so in other words, it's what you just described. Mm -hmm. When they want to describe something, they don't know what to call it. Right. So you, do you know how we do that? Mm. You think I'm crazy. It's the worst day of my life. Mm. You heard that one? Mm -hmm. Don't they tell you it's the worst day? It was the worst experience of my life. It was the worst meal I ever ate. It was mm -hmm. the yeah, best yeah, yeah, boyfriend sure. I ever had. And so you start yeah. out with, you know, oh my God, it was the worst day of your life. It, because it, it's this bad. Was it as bad as the day when you uh, uh. broke up with your boyfriend? No, it wasn't as bad as that. Because they also right, don't have right, a scale. Right. So sure. we, mm -hmm. we keep going yeah, yeah, with, yeah. with different experiences and we keep going mm -hmm. smaller and smaller and smaller. And you can do this with measuring cups, mm -hmm. but it's a visual yeah. to establish because they, they can't grade it. They can't give language to the gradations. Right. So if you can lower the well, it wasn't as bad as that. Then the emotion comes down. Right. I think. Mm -hmm. I hope. Mm -hmm. Have you That's tried great. this, anybody? I've done it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I, I should do it more. I, yeah, I think. Would you like to do a quick introduction so you know who was in the room? Sure. Lisa, go ahead. Hi, I'm Lisa Kevin. I uh, have been working with Valerie for six years. I have two daughters who are now 22 and 24 both of whom have borderline, one, both undiagnosed, mm -hmm. one entering the world a little bit more now and one really just stuck in misinterpretation mm -hmm. yeah. and rejection sensitivity. That mm -hmm. was her in the video that yeah, I showed right, you. Right, right. Um, I'm a retired public school teacher. She's a Torah teacher. Hi, I'm Susie. Um, I'm Valerie's intern, um, and I'm currently getting my um, licensure in mental health counseling. Great. Hi, I'm Noreen Boyle. Um, I have two daughters that are borderline, 20 and 23, and I'm learning from Valerie and uh, Lisa and how to be a, a, a better uh, parent to borderline children. She learned so fast that we trained her to, to teach. 
<coughs> when he's called with them, I took Valerie's Aiden course. In 1801. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we should check it at least six or seven or eight years ago. And I have a 13 year old daughter, and my ex has borderline, and it's stressful on my daughter. And that's why um, Valerie's course is recommended to me. And I'm here just to get back in touch. Kamalana Rabinowitz and um, Carl's partner, and I'm um, here because um, his daughter spends half her time with us, and I want to understand a little bit more about what's going on for her and possibly how to help her. I'm Uriel Rosenberg, and I am Lisa's mother, so the grandmother of the two girls, mm -hmm. and naturally I am very interested in helping. When they took the class the first time years ago, she came for one daughter, mm -hmm. and Lisa spoke for the other daughter. <laughs> she, they didn't realize both of them had it until that. That was unbelievable. That was amazing. When we did the go around, my mother said, "I'm here for my daughter, for my granddaughter, um, Molly." And I was like, "Not Molly, December." <laughs> and then I said, "Ooh," but we, you know, we had said she, 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 but mm -hmm. we we had so different funny. children. I'm Sarah Piscatelli. I've been uh, working with Valerie for 14 years. 15. 15 years. Since you were pick 14. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and my sister has borderline, and also uh, one of my mom's siblings, my uncle. And Only one. <laughs> well, <laughs> depends. You, they, they'll have a ball with your family's DNA, kid. <laughs> Um, yeah, and that, so I've been working and teaching with Valerie. We developed a couple, a supplemental couples class and a sibling class. That's Regina's daughter. Oh, wow. Yeah. Hello. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Heard about you. <laughs> I'm Dee, um, and I uh, took Valerie's course probably years ago, too. I don't know if before. Had I written the book by the time you took it? No. Uh, you were in the process. Um, and I have a daughter who's 38, who has borderline. Are you a clinician? So, what? Are you a clinician? I am a, a, a teacher. I, I was a reading specialist, and I just retired in June. Mm -hmm. Yay! Yeah. Mm -hmm. Marina? I'm Marina. I'm uh, from Mexico, and I was diagnosed. I'm not with something nobody told me what it was. And one year ago, I finally heard the borderline personality disorder. How old are you? Huh? How old are you? When I heard the... No, how old are you now? Uh, 30. Yeah, I've been six and six, six. I don't know. How did this, how did the presentation seem to you? Confusing. Yeah. Uh, did it did it ring a bell for you? Yeah, confusing and uh, it rang bells, but overwhelming. Overwhelming. Yeah. My name's Chris. Uh, I showed up here maybe close to a year ago, nine months ago. Um, initially thinking my my wife, and after spending some time here. Just say more than my wife and my family environment, and uh, it's been a, an amazing place for me to to learn what's going, or to kind of learn what's going on. Or, or um, it's been a big help. Um, what what we experience, all of us, is um, if you're sitting down and a thought passes through your mind. Now you can tell me whether this is your experience. You're sitting there and you go. Oh. God, she's going to start with me again. And the person turns around, and what do they do? They read your mind. Mm -hmm. They know. They, we do the, you know the METT training for ECMA? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, when I have time, I show them the METT yeah. training. And I think that if you, do you remember that, where you look at a facial expression? And it's, it's on the computer. You can buy the program, and you see a face, and it goes, and it makes this like little face, and um, you can slow it down, you can speed it up, and, 
but you have to name what emotion showed in that fraction of a second. So with the teachers that are here, we, we do it pretty often. So the teachers, I think for therapists, it should be absolutely required. Yeah, right. Because when you're talking to somebody, you see that micro expression. And that's more of a hint of what's going mm -hmm. on than anything else. Mm -hmm. Is that what you do in transfer focus therapy? A little bit, yeah. I mean, you know, it's a lot. A lot of times in transverse focus psychotherapy, you're very actively using the client's reactions to you as, you know, kind of the idea is, um, you know, as we're forming this relationship, therapy relationship, you know, a lot of the, you know, biases, a lot of the over attributions that are common in relationships are, of course, going to happen in the therapist, and, um, you know, a, in in this treatment approach, rather than try and um, kind of correct it out or kind of say no, that didn't happen, or, you know, there's a, a welcoming of it, of kind of really is like let's let's look at the, all the assumptions you're having about me because they're probably the ones that are tripping you up in relationships out there too. So um, yeah, so it's a lot of so it's very actively using the impressions of the therapist and the therapist-patient relationship as as a template for the kinds of. You know, kind of misattributions that are probably happening out there in life a lot. Could you explain a little what transference is? Because everybody knows what DBT is, oh, but sure. nobody knows what transference is. Yeah. Someday you'll give me a referral <laughs> list. <laughs> sure, sure. So, um, so transference is an old word, but it you know basically means um, that you know we 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 always do this thing where we fill in the blanks. Um, you know, uh, you know, even if you you know, you know think of someone you're just getting to know, um, you know, someone you don't know very well, you know, it would be how, how painful it would be if we had to relearn how to be with every single person we meet, right? And we don't, we don't do that, right? Instead, what do we do? We kind of meet a person, they kind of remind us of someone we know, and we kind of fill in the blanks of, you know, well, I don't know exactly what to say to this person, but I know how, what to say to the, this kind of person as a big way of kind of getting us by, right? Um, and so the kind of, the schemas that we carry around for different kinds of people, where do they come from? They come from our early relationships, you know? So, um, you know, all of my, you know, uh, you know, I just met Chris, I don't know him, but, um, you know, he's about the age of my brother, he's got kind of a bit of that kind of spirit and energy that my brother has. You know, I could probably get pretty far in a kind of us hitting up a conversation based on some assumptions. And then, of course, as I talk to Chris and see that there's actually ways in which he's very different from my brother, I adapt, I evolve, right? So, but my initial gut impression of who Chris is before I really know that is my transference, right? Um, with a therapist, those are often very, uh, um, we, we rely on those for a while because the therapists don't tell us a lot about themselves. Right? Um, so, you know, if Chris was my therapist, you know, I'm not going to be hearing about, you know, his life and what he does on the weekends and, you know, what he had for dinner. And so my kind of gut impression of who he is is going to for a while rely a lot on my brother schema, right? And so I'm going to be filling in the blanks. And if, let's say, I have a really problematic relationship with my brother, then there's going to be a lot of distortions and I'm going to have all sorts of ideas about the kind of guy that Chris is. Sorry, I hope it's okay, I'm borrowing you. Yeah, that's, that's, that's interesting. Um, you know, um, that are probably off base, right? And not only, so, but they're kind, probably, the ways in which I'm probably off base about Chris are probably representative about the ways I'm off base about a lot of people in my life. It's just that because I actually don't know the facts of the therapist, that's going to be in a bigger spotlight than it would usually be in a relationship. And then the therapist uses that actively, like, oh, so... You know, I'm, I'm one of those guys, huh? You know, kind of uses it to kind of, kind of highlight and um, you know bring to life the assumptions that that person's carrying in relationships. Along. Questions? I just have one comment. Um, two things. The thing you said uh, about being right or wrong mm -hmm. was it something you ask yourself as someone uh, among us, like, yeah, because that's right. a question I ask myself yeah. all the time. Am so, I right or am I, is it right or tomorrow is not going to be the same? Maybe it's, should I trust myself? 
how right. could I trust myself in the others if I cannot trust myself? You know? Yeah, no, it, right, exactly. So one of the things that we think kind of comes out of this is that actually trying to get people away from asking the question of is it right or is it wrong? Because, you know, what, what this data suggests is that um, sometimes it is right. In the case of this, sometimes, you know, I, I think I saw a quick emotion there and that's correct. Sometimes there was no emotion there, but I said there was and that was incorrect. And that there's really no way to know, right? And as the, you know, so for you for yourself, there's probably no way to know, right? And if um, someone says to me, oh, you just gave me a dirty look, there's no way for me to know whether I actually did or didn't, right? And so instead, what we encourage people to think about is um, of all the, you know, of all the emotion cues I'm giving out, why is this the one that has taken on such importance, right? Of all the, you know, of all the, the facts, of all the data, why, why is this the one that is, aha, the evidence, you know? And so, so we try and get people away from, am I correct, am I incorrect, can I trust myself, not can I trust myself? And instead say, kind of, what are my biases? What are my, you know, where, where do I tend to lean, especially when stressed, right? Um, and, you know, if, you know, um, you know, if, so if a client I'm working with, you know, kind of help them to know where their radar is tuned up to. And, you know, kind of, it may be tuned up to assuming a negative emotion is there. And sometimes it is, and sometimes it's not. But that's the, that's the leaning, and kind of get to know your leaning. There's a woman named Rebbe who made a film that was showing in a week or so. And she spent a year at McLean. And um, so I asked her, what made you go to McLean? She was 39 when she went to McLean. And her answer was remarkable in that she said, well, I was having problems with interpersonal relationships. And I said, well, what was the problem? She said, I, I was always right. She said, and I started to think that, how could I always be right? So that's very interesting that you said that, because it's exactly what she said. But the thing is, um, we work with a girl named Alka. I don't know if you've heard her speak at conferences. And um, we teach a lot of neurobiology of how the brain works. So the word. <coughs> dialectic behavior therapy. Dialectic means that two things can exist at the same time. You know, if I think that this is light red and you think it's dark red, who's right? You know, is there an ultimate truth in everything? So I think that the reason she calls it dialectic behavior therapy is to give up the idea of right and wrong. But you just said something that for me was very helpful that she doesn't trust mm -hmm. her own yeah. right. her own idea of is it right or wrong. So this young woman named Alka who's been doing so very well, who works with us, she has borderline, and she said that what she learned from seeing how the brain works is that she has to fact check mm. all the time. So she stops to fact check so that she doesn't go on whether she's right or wrong. She takes that gut reaction and she kind of checks out to see if it's if it if it's um, if it works. I don't know if that helps you. How does she do that? Examining the evidence. Takes so, too long. <laughs> yeah. Too Until it becomes automatic. Well like with yeah. her boyfriend. She would read her boyfriend's face. She didn't know if she misread it or read it correctly. So over time she learned to ask. I think you're angry at me. Did I get that right? Mm. That's mentalization. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. And then he had a chance to say, oh, no, I was just thinking about whatever, or, you know, yeah, I, I, you got me. Mm. You know, so that's part of... It was so true <coughs> what you said about, I have so much control with, I'm like even introverted and quiet, and with, I have so much control with people around me, but when it comes to people that I know, mm. or they know me, I've, yeah, I become a, like a monster, a totally different person. 
you just said you become like a monster. Why don't you just say you become more open, more because the monster no, because, business, uh, because you're right down the slide to shame. Mm -hmm. That's where the good, the wrong, the right comes in, mm -hmm. with the shame. Mm -hmm. Because it's not more open, it's just... But why would you say you become a monster? That's why we had that survey with 500 responses mm -hmm. saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. So that was my question, was about the emotional control. Like, mm. in BDP, the com well, there's no component for teaching emotional control, right? No, there is in DBT. There, there is in DBT? Would you say DBT teaches emotional yeah. control? Yeah. But the effortful, it's called effortful control? Yes, yeah. So, like, that name implies to me that it's, like, conscious, right? But I'm wondering if that it's, are you saying it's not conscious, it's temperamental, it's, like, your, your natural ability to have control over your... Can, can you explain a little yeah, bit more? Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's a great question. I mean, so it's... Th the idea is not that it, it... It's not so conscious. I mean, you know, I kind of played out, for example, my thought process about the cookie, but honestly, I'm not thinking that through, right? It's just a very quick, under-the-surface calculation that gets made. Um, and so they do think about it more as kind of temperamental. Um, and... Um, um, can, I, can I just say, it, sure. it, it, does it have anything to do with like delaying gratification? Yes, yes, that's exactly so right. That's one thing I yeah. think about when my kids were younger. Yeah. And I remember being in a classroom one time and they had asked certain questions and stuff like that. And I, and I know that both my kids had difficulty yeah. with that. Yeah. And, you know, they, like again, they in public, they can, you know, they are great actresses, mm -hmm. yeah. but with me, mm -hmm. it's you know I, it's like living in a nightmare. Chris, you know? yeah, that's how I pictured it. I can yeah. be any kind of people. Yeah, talk with sixty year old to fifty year old. I can be a hippie. I yeah. can be a right. But I can do whatever. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, I remember what I wanted to say too. We're going to the question. Um, you know, the, I think the other importance around the effortful control is that, um, you know, I mean, this is something that I think uh, you all may have some awareness of as well, is that, you know, there's sometimes there's this idea that gets talked about of, you know, borderline personality disorder is not one thing, right? That it's borderline personality disorders. I mean, there's a, it's a you know, there's a, a spectrum, um, you know, because it's a disorder where, you know, there's kind of these nine different symptoms of which you need five, but it doesn't say which five. And so people have, you know, kind of... 273 different yeah, ways. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that hooks me all up. It took me, that, that reading yeah. that, took me an extra two or three years to get here yeah. and get help because yeah. of that. Because it because not, because you can have uh, one person who's kind of the prototypical version in your mind, and then another person who looks very different, but, you know, still there's... The, and so, um, and so, one of the symptoms that uh, people with borderline personality disorder differ wildly on are things around impulsivity. Um, there's some, you know, people with better versus worse impulse control and um, better and worse effortful control. It's not an automatic thing that someone with borderline personality disorder is going to have poor effortful control. Um, and you, you're exactly right. There's the, um, the it's exactly related to delay of gratification. There's that classic marshmallow experiment. Oh, Remember God. that one? Mm -hmm. um, I show you that in class mm -hmm. that Walter yeah. Michelle. Yeah. Oh, God, that's so funny. So this is the one where they um, put a marshmallow in front of a, say, six-year-old kid and say, um, you can eat the marshmallow now, or you can wait three minutes, uh, oh, you know, whatever. and uh, at the end of it, you can have two marshmallows if you wait. Um, and, they, you know, there's the group of kids who grab the marshmallow and go, nope, and plop it right in their mouth, right in the low delayers, and then there's the kids who wait the full three minutes and get their two marshmallows. And when they follow the kids over time, they find that the delayers have a lot of really good outcomes, uh, tend to do well at work and, you know, things like that. Um, and so that's directly related to this idea of effortful control. And so the idea is not that it's necessarily a conscious deliberation, but it's kind of 
holding off on your knee-jerk reaction, right? I mean, the knee-jerk thing is you can eat the marshmallow now, then I'm eating the marshmallow now, right? But it's that, wait a minute, you know, that kind of, just a kind of tendency to be able to hold off, think through what do I want, and then kind of respond accordingly. But, but also, wouldn't, that, wouldn't you say that that could also be that maybe you don't trust that you're going to give them to in the future? Sure. You know, like yeah, you sure. Ooh, say, look, it's here right yeah. now. I'm just right. gonna, I, I can tell you from experience from my kids, that's what it yeah. is. Yeah. I can see that. Mm. That's very interesting. It is. That's very interesting. And, very and that, interesting. You know, that you see that with mm. you know, relationships that can happen right. with people as well. You know, it's interesting with this whole thing that you're describing. Um, the way I've been coming to think of it for myself is you have this high amygdala, huge threat response, higher than other people's. And then you have this area in the brain where you're negatively biased, where you have objection sense, I mean, you've like this whole negative, it's all about me, they hate me, shame, and the point is all of that is experienced as emotional pain. Mm -hmm. And for me, I've been thinking lately about this, the next step is, you know, controlling it. Mm -hmm. What am I going to do about it? Right. Is that the 200 whatever varieties of borderline, that's, to me, I don't think about that anymore. I think that you have this threat, <coughs> misinterpretation, pain. Now, what am I going to do about the pain? Well, I'll sleep with every guy in the mm -hmm. room. I'll go out and get drunk. Yeah. I'll use drugs. I'll scream at somebody. I'll shoplift. I'll run around the block. In other words, what I see is the, that what you're describing but then after that, it's that, that that's interpreted as pain. Yes. Then what do they do with the pain? Mm -hmm. And that's where your control is. Do they have tolerance of distress? Right. Can, they control, can they cope with that pain in the moment? And I think that's why when it's people closest to them, the pains, I don't know, does that make any sense to anybody? Yeah. That's my hair brain theory. Yeah. Does it make any sense? No, it makes total sense, yeah. Yeah, this, um, there was this amazing, amazing article is in this month's American Psychiatric Journal. I just think it's incredible. How many of you remember me saying that borderline suicide is about pain, that they don't want to die, and that um, that someday they're going to invent a drug that's going to bring up their opiates? Do you remember me saying that? That's what they just found out in Israel, Yarmulkeville. They took um, low doses of buprenorphine. Mm. What do you call it? Zabaxin? Mm -hmm. Zabaxin? Yeah. Low doses of buprenorphine mm. on depressed and borderlines mm. who were suicidal. And it brought down, brought down wow. the suicidality. And mm. he describes it as mental pain. Mm -hmm. And he says it's different than neurovegetative suicide. Mm. It's the first time I ever saw anybody say that. Mm -hmm. Where is this article? I'll give you one. Oh, thanks. I prepared it. Thank Just you. To, it might have went over my head, but... The Do you understand what that means? The, sorry, the therapy trends? Yeah, trans trans focus. Trans therapy focus. Mm -hmm. I know, you kind of explained it. Mm -hmm. and, and what I, is it, is it, for me to sum it up, is it basically uh, for you to get people to to think, like you were saying, why with everything going on I came up with this? Mm -hmm. is, is, I'm asking, is, is, that, is that the therapy or is... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just yeah, trying to no, understand no, what the, yeah. the definition of that therapy or how, what, yeah. what, what that, how that works. Yeah, so, so the, ther the therapy is really focused on a person's kind of biases about the way they view others and biases in the way they view themselves, you know. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, like we're talking about this idea of that there's many probably borderline personality disorders. and. You know, when uh, I meet with somebody who comes in and they're just really struggling with the impulse control problems, I think DBT is really, you know, the yeah. best in terms of just turning down the volume on these very right. intense impulse control problems. But when people come in and, you know, they're actually, they're, you know, they're not out doing destructive things, but they're really more what's struggling with them is that they see themselves in really distorted ways and they see other people in really distorted ways. I think this kind of treatment is actually really helpful with that, right? Um, because, like, let's say, um, I don't know, let's say, for example, so my transference to you is that um, 
you know, you're, you know, you're this, you're this doctor, um, you have your life together as compared to I, you know, I don't. And so my assumption about you is that I'm, you know, you are, you know, you have it all together. You have not a problem in the world and I, you know, am Very unworthy, rich. right? You know, um, think about that. Think about there's a lot of assumptions and biases in that, right? I mean, like, first of all, like, is that true that, you know, that your life is perfect? You know, probably, of course not. You probably know? not. <laughs> and also that I am unworthy, so, right? I mean, like, you know, so none of those assumptions are true, right? But they're telling. And they're probably the kind of thing that come up again and again and again in relationships, right? If I feel unworthy with you as my therapist, I probably feel unworthy in my romantic relationships. I probably feel unworthy of a raise at a job, you know. And so, and so it's uh, emblematic, you know. And so, and so the idea is that the therapist is a good person to play that out with because those, you know, again, like I was saying, because the therapist is not, you know your buddy who's revealing, you know, that it's all out there to be potentially evaluated, right? And so, so yeah, I think that this, it's a very helpful uh, treatment approach for people who their, their main struggle is these kind of, you know, seeing oneself and seeing others in, through these kind of distorted lenses. So, so you, uh, you're helping them to sort of develop SEMA that is more productive or or more helpful to, to them. I mean, I that's what I'm trying to understand. Yeah. I mean, because they, they have they have a warped scheme. Right. Right. So you are helping them to so develop it, it. Yes, but so um so the idea though in this treatment is that it's not. I mean, you know this as well. That it's not it's not so helpful to say no, I'm not. You know that 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 that's a stalled conversation. And so instead of trying to correct it, there's a kind of opening it up and then inviting it, like, well, why would I do that? I mean, you know, this is very consistent with what you were describing, right? Kind of, um, but like, kind of really getting at, you know, like, what's, you know, what are the worries? What are the fantasies? What are the kind of assumptions, you know, kind of really unpack it all um, and get to, like, you know, so like, for example, Valerie was, you know, I so agree about how, you know, the importance of shame, right? So if we play out my example, you know, that I was developing with Chris, of, you know, you're this, you know, perfect doctor, I'm unworthy, you know, like, what are we going to get to if Chris says, well, what do you mean? How come? What makes you think that? We're probably going to get to just shame, right? To like, I feel so, you know, so much shame that, you know, you know, you by contrast, if you see my badness, surely you're going to reject me, right? I mean, like, so like, so instead of trying to, what, in this treatment that they're really trying not to say, no, 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 that's wrong. Think of it this way instead, right? Because I just, just that it's, it's, for, for a lot of people, that falls on deaf ears, right? And so it's more like, kind of like... It's a judgment. Un, un, it's a judgment, right? So it's more like, unpack it, tell me, how come, where'd you get that idea? What makes you think that? So what's gonna happen if I do that? that you know, like a really welcoming of it to get to all the kind of nitty gritties of the concern. And, you know, the hope is that in the experience then of, you know, it doesn't play out that way, right? Um, and, you know, kind of, now that we understand where it comes from and it hasn't happened, there could be some kind of movement in that way. Right. So that they're learning to develop trust. Yes. yes. They're not just seeing it black and white. Right. They're seeing that there's a lot more to it just with right. the eye. Right. We always explain it that DBT is, if you think of the four skills that she has, mindfulness is to be aware of your own body, be aware of the moment going this way. Yeah. And then you have emotion regulation, not yours, my emotion regulation. And then my ability to tolerate my distress. Mm -hmm. And then interpersonal relationships, which are not interpersonal. They're about how I ask you for what I want. Yeah, sure. So for me, DBT is all about the person controlling themselves mm -hmm. in the environment. Right. So on. Mentalization is for me, you know, when we teach it more of well, why would I say that? What did you mean by that? Um, um, you you would say, it looks like I just got you angry. What did I say? Right. It wasn't my intention. Right. So mentalization is reaching out much more right. to the to the other person. But it's, so we combine them. Yeah. But transference mm -hmm. seems to be the only treatment that gets at this sense of badness, sense of shame, 
my only problem with with transfers is it takes long and it takes it's expensive. Like, and, yeah, it is. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, yeah. how do we make an instant transfer? say how long? What's what's a typical? Or I know there's is no typical, but you know, it's the. I mean, it's the kind of thing where I think the power of it starts to really unfold as you get close to the therapist and all the you know. I mean. Kind of, if you think about what I was saying, you know, of all the assumptions I'm going to have about you, and that, you know, I mean, that's a process that's going to unfold over time as I know you as the therapist and care you about you as the therapist, and like this is meaningful to me, and so therefore, you're leaving or not leaving me matters a lot, right? That's not, I'm not going to feel that in session two, right? I mean, that's something that is going to, you know, um, become more intense as the relationship deepens. So. You need to invest a little time in the therapeutic relationship to kind of get that. So you're, you're so right. What's your average amount of time? Five years? Uh, it shouldn't hopefully take that long. I mean, you know, so uh, uh, we did a psychotherapy study that was twice a week for a year, and we had the feeling that that was not quite enough. But so for the next one, we're doing 18 months twice a week. You know, I hope that would be you know enough time to get good piece of work done, but that's not quick. I mean, right? I mean, that's... that's but you know, when you it's, think it's about it... It's life-changing. It's life-changing, I mean, it's, it's, that's the, that's it's not quick. No, it's not quick. But, but you're, what the, the thing is, if you're looking at neurogenesis, yeah. which is growing new neuronal brain circuits right. to create new behaviors, you're not doing it once a week. No, but you're, not. you're not. It's... Um, we also think it's very important the reinforcement they get in the environment, yeah, sure. which transference is much harder to reinforce than DVD yeah. yeah. or, or mentalization. Um, but my other observation, teaching all you lovely folks, is that the level of people's awareness of emotions and of the ability to name emotions, yeah. with or without borderline, is about this big. Mm -hmm. And if if the if the family, the partners, can't recognize their own emotions, mm -hmm. how can they improve communication with the other person? When the other person can't name their emotions. Sure. I mean, it's like you're both blind in the dark, sure. you know. Sure. And I wonder if that's cultural.